Good evening to those that are joining. We'll give a few more minutes for a couple more to log on. For those that are joining, hope you've had a good day. We'll just give it about one more minute because there's still some more participants logging in. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Paige Harrington. I work as a medical director with Vets Pets and um, got to know Dr. Robert Brady about 10 years ago and was very, very happy when he and his wife decided to move to Eastern North Carolina to join Points East Veterinary Specialty Hospital. He as a surgeon and she, Abby Brady, as an emergency doctor. Um, Dr. Brady is actually from this area and grew up in, in Eastern North Carolina. He obtained his bachelor's in kinesiology and his master's in biome biomechanics from East Carolina University. He obtained his veterinary degree from St. George's University, did an internship at Animal Medical Hospital in Charlotte, and then found himself in Memphis, Tennessee at the Memphis Veterinary Specialist for his residency. And then came back here and has been working very hard for the pets in our area um, you know, since the fall of 2020. Um, tonight, he's going to be joining us to talk about common abdominal surgeries, the pearls of wisdom from the surgery suite. So thank you, Dr. Brady, for preparing this conversation for us tonight as we all struggle sometimes with some of these more difficult surgeries. Uh, throughout the conversation, if there's anything that you guys um, you know, need to put on the chat to ask a question, if it's pertinent to the slide that we're on, I might interrupt Dr. Brady and ask him a question. We'll take periodic breaks as well to do some Q&A and then definitely a longer Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, Dr. Brady openly admitted that he, some of his slides are a little wordy because he wanted to make sure that we had all the information that we needed. So don't feel, feel free just to sit back and listen. We will be sharing the PowerPoint when we send your CE certificate within the next week. Um, so all the things that he has on here, you will be receiving with a copy of the PowerPoint. And thank you, Dr. Brady, and I will pass it over to you. Thank you, Paige, for that introduction, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, as Dr. Harrington mentioned, um, the PowerPoint is a little bit of a different style than I normally take, you know, and kind of different than the recommendations. There are a lot of words on the slides, but I'm hoping that it can be a resource um, for some of you to reference if you'd like. Um, if you ever get in a situation and are just curious how, how different people approach things. So uh, Dr. Page, I already mentioned all of these things about me um, as far as my, my professional background. Personally, you know, I was born in Tarboro, married to Abigail Brady, as she mentioned. Uh, we have an, a three-year-old named Deacon and an eight-month-old named Nimerson, and we have a little hobby farm called Swamp Dog Farm um, over in Macclesfield. Uh, there's a little picture from when we were first getting started. Um, that's the Swamp Dog himself, Hamilton. Um, posing for that picture there. And uh, we're just, you know, when I'm not playing at Vets Pets, I'm spending a lot of time out there with the, the goats and livestock and ultimately hoping to get some cows and stuff, but it's a work in progress. So we'll start out with a, a simple question, um, you know, get an idea of the audience. How many of you guys are doing uh, routine abdominal procedures outside of, you know, spay uh, for the most part? Um, you know, whether it's many of the things we'll talk about today, foreign bodies, GDVs, 
uh, those kinds of things there. So we'll give you about 20 seconds or so so everybody can get a chance to answer. All right, so it's looking like roughly uh, two thirds of you guys are doing these procedures um, and about a third of you aren't doing too many of them. So I'm, I'm happy to have both of you guys here. Uh, so hopefully these will these tips again will be helpful for you guys um, moving forward and just some things to think about from a different perspective. And again, most of this is just my way of doing things. It's not you know set in stone that it's a end all be all. So we all have to work within our means and get creative sometimes. But these are some of the the things that I'm thinking about. So we'll start out with the beginning. So with any you know anesthetic procedure. Uh, we got to think about our goals of anesthesia. Um, most commonly for, for a lot of our guys, we have the opportunity to utilize good pre-medications. Um, oral pre-meds are great if you have a scheduled procedure like a splenectomy, for example, uh, utilizing serenia and trazodone and gabapentin in the preoperative period. You know, Even if you can get the owners to give it at home, it just helps a lot with your patient handling. Once they get in the hospital, if they're a little less stressed, a little more calm, it makes the rest of the day go uh, more smoothly. And um, you know, throughout the PowerPoint, there's lots of doses that I typically reference. Um, you know, there's so many doses out there and everything has a range almost. So you'll see that as well, but these are the common doses that we, we that I commonly go with. So, um, you know, if you can get some orals on board ahead of time, that's excellent. If not, then injectables are your friend. Uh, very commonly, we use dexmedetomidine, uh, you know, three to 10 micrograms per kilogram IM or IV. Uh, typically, of course, if you're using IM, a higher dose is helpful. Uh, hydromorphone is typically readily available, and typically we go with a 0.1 mg per kg, again, IM or IV. Uh, be careful of the vomiting with hydro IM. Uh, we see less of that when it's given IV slowly. Uh, and then there's lots of other options for what you have in the hospital, you know, pure muse for these big abdominal procedures. You know, I would advise against using TORB if you can. It's just not as good of a uh, pain medication. Buprenex is a good option for your kitty cats. You know, I'm not a huge fan of Buprenex in dogs, um, really at any level, if I can help it. And then other medications like acepromazine and stuff like that as needed. You know, if you have a little bit of a heart compromise, a low dose of acepromazine, like a 0.01 mg per kg or 0.02 mg per kg is very helpful. Induction, you know, we like to use a co-induction, typically with a low dose of ketamine, two mg per kg, followed by propofol to effect. Normally we draw up four mg per kg. Lots of options there as well, based off of what you have, alfaxalone, midazolam, diazepam. Probably not many of you guys are using etomidate. Um, we don't really use etomidate except for in our most critical of patients. So uh, another thing about you know anesthesia epidurals, um, I'm not sold on epidurals and their helpfulness for abdominal surgery and thoracic surgery. Um, there's plenty of anesthesiologists that would disagree with me and some that would agree with me. Um, Speaking to our nurses, you know, they don't really see a great MAC reduction and stuff like that when we're using epidurals, but should you choose to, it's definitely appropriate, um, you know, well, well warranted and morphine epidural is most commonly used and then they've come up with a number arbitrarily of less than six mils um, for an epidural um, total volume. Uh, you know, again, that's an arbitrary number. I've never seen any actual uh, study that that represents you know six mils and it's going to breach the diaphragm in a 30 kilogram dog but nonetheless even if you're only using a, a morphine you don't have to worry about paralyzing the diaphragm if you're using combinations like morphine and bupivacaine and you can have to worry about that a little bit and then all of our patients get you know perioperative antibiotics and for most of the routine things that we're doing that are Hopefully simple, we use tefazolin, um, 22 mg per kg, uh, within about 30 minutes of your incision and repeated every 90 minutes thereafter intraoperatively. And then I like to follow up with two additional doses at Q8 postoperatively. So I don't routinely give a lot of postoperative antibiotics in a pill form, um, but I do make sure that my, my patients have about 24 hours of coverage of good antibiotic and tefazolin works very well for most of the skin common solids that we have to worry about. So that's kind of the, the first step is getting your patient ready for anesthesia. Um, and then 
intraoperatively, we utilize a lot of CRIs, which are you know really helpful in reducing MAC and uh, gas sparing and all those things that we learned about. I'm a big fan of fentanyl CRIs intraoperatively, you know, three to five mic per kg bolus, followed by a seven to 10 mic per kg per hour. Those doses can be almost doubled um, if necessary, but I find that typically that, you know, seven to 10 mics per kg per hour works very well intraoperatively. And then postoperatively, we can only cut that in half or even more, about three mics per kg per hour postoperatively. And again, there's lots of wiggle room for fentanyl. So it really helps us tailor our pain control for our patients. And pain scoring is very important for your nurses to, to help you um, know if they're a little painful to increase it a little bit. They're a little bit gorked, back it back a little bit. We commonly also use lidocaine for GI for abdominal procedures. Um, it helps with visceral pain, helps promote some gastric motility and you know, radical oxygen species scavenging typically standard 50 mic per kg per minute, um, intraoperatively and postoperatively. Uh, I'll utilize that essentially until it runs out, um, you know, from my, whatever I've used intraoperatively, just let it run for a few hours after surgery. The same thing with the ketamine CRI. Um, ketamine helps maintain sympathetic tone, uh, which is great for helping maintain blood pressure, as well as it has great analgesia as well. And again, 10 mics per kick per minute there intraoperatively, and then two mics per kick per minute postoperatively. And essentially, you know, trying to keep these guys on the medications for several hours after surgery, just to give them time to, to recover well and keep their pain as well controlled as possible. Uh, and then throughout all of that, running ISO as, as low as possible, um, oftentimes, you know, less than 1%, we are able to get these guys down to. So, you know, we've thought about our anesthetic plan and now we got to get them prepped for surgery. And I know all this seems redundant, but um, just kind of giving you guys an idea of how we do it um, and how I like for it to be done. 2% chlorhexidine and 70% uh, alcohol, very standard prep protocol. Number one thing you got to do is get the organic debris off. You know, first step is get them clean, you know, physically clean. And then the second step is contact time. Um, chlorhexidine solution is recommended for a minimum of three minutes of contact time, which we got to think about if you're utilizing an alternating approach. So if you're using chlorhexidine, alcohol, chlorhexidine, alcohol, you're really making it difficult to get to that full three minutes of chlorhexidine um, contact time. So really utilizing, you know, chlorhexidine in a nice routine scrubbing manner. Um, there are different techniques, but the biggest thing is make sure that you focus on your incisional area and go out from there. Um, utilizing chlorhex, chlorhex, chlorhex until you have a very clean surface and then three minutes of good contact time and then coming back with the alcohol essentially to remove the sudsy debris and then to allow the, the surgery site to dry faster um, since alcohol, you know, is having a drying agent in it. And then for our, you know, prepucial flushes, uh, I commonly like to have the, uh, the, the prepuce draped into my surgeries in case I need to need it, um, especially for, you know, um, urinary surgeries. Um, so, so we always flush the prep use with a dilute betadine 10% for prepucial flush. Again, contact time is the main thing and using an appropriately diluted betadine. Draping, uh, draping is, you know, a big deal. Um, it's, it's very important to, to have a good sterile field to work with to minimize contamination. Uh, it's important to drape the entire abdomen every time. Um, you know, we'll talk about incision sizes in a minute, but you don't want to drape two inches and then heaven forbid you need the whole thing should something happen. So always having the entire abdomen uh, draped, you know, my borders that I use in my mind are essentially the nipples laterally and a clipper blade width cranial to the xiphoid and caudal, you know, depending on the procedure past the prep use. If, uh, if I'm doing a female urinary surgery, then I include the vulva. And the same thing with flushing the vulva with dilute betadine. Um, minimum of two layers, and one of those layers should be impermeable, meaning that fluids are not going to uh, wick through the material. So having an impermeable layer so that you're not wicking those potential contaminants towards the surgery site, um, having a base layer and then a, a, another layer is how we approach it. The picture on the left is kind of our base layer, just a standard four quadrant drape with towel clamps. Um, the more the, the more the merrier. You know, I, I don't like seeing a big abdomen with just four clamps on it. Um, I like to use at least six 
um, if not eight in some of our patients. This is a little 15 kilogram um, staffy who had a duodenal RNA last week um, that we got a couple pictures of. And then the picture on the right is kind of the finished product with a full drape. You know, then we have a couple four towel clamps just for the outer layer and our table set up and everything like that. So um, patient prep is, you know, imperative to help reduce post-operative complications. Now, my little soapbox, as mentioned a minute ago, is simply, you know, having the large incision. Uh, large incisions are imperative to abdominal surgery. They make it easy for you to do your job and to do it well, helps you with visualization. You know, there are no prizes for tiniest incision. Uh, incisions heal side to side, not end to end. So, you know, my stem to stern incision is going to heal pretty much the same as a six inch incision will. So large incision, 10 blade, number four scalpel handle, um, xiphoid to at least the level of the prep use in male dogs. If you're doing, you know, more routine GI surgery, of course, you have to go around the prep use if you're doing uh, bladder surgery, for example. As you're going around the, the prep use, careful of the caudal superficial epigastrics, you know, visualizing them, ligating them as needed. Um, another thing that's very important is to adequately expose the linea. Um, when I do see complications with uh, closure of abdomen, it's typically due to failure to engage the external rectus sheath. So adequately cleaning off your linea is imperative so that when it comes time to close, you can identify your layers appropriately and you can get those cleaned off. And, um, you know, it just makes closure faster. You're not guessing, it makes closure more secure because you're not engaging a lot of fat into your closure, which can then break down and potentially lead to loosening of sutures. And then as we're getting into the abdomen, tent the linea as much as possible. Um, you know, really grabbing the umbilicus is typically the best place to gab, grab, I found, because there's typically a little bit of excess tissue there that you can grab a hold on well. Making a stab incision with a 10 blade or a 15 blade, I typically will extend the linea just large enough to get a finger in. Um, and then that way I can palpate all around my incision to make sure there are no adhesions, uh, especially if it's the second time an animal's had a surgery, we don't know a history, perhaps they've got a perforation and adhesions everywhere, perhaps they had a gastropexy in the past that was, you know, sutured essentially to the suture line. So I'll, I'll pass my finger into the incision, palpate all around, extend, palpate all around, make sure that you know, I'm not aberrantly cutting into something I don't want to. Um, so that's, that's also an important thing. And I like to extend with mayo scissors. Um, Extending with a blade is just fine as long as you're keeping it tinted either with a, you know, a blade guide or using a, a pair of um, thumb forceps as a guide works works well too. Um, I like the scissors because it gives me a little more control and making sure to use the appropriate scissors, which would be a Mayo, not your nice delicate medicine bombs. So here's an example of, you know, a, a abdominal surgery we did last week. Um, you can kind of see the base layer underneath the top layer there. Uh, I've labeled the xiphoid and the pubis for you. So you can see that it is, you know, this was a thin dog. So there's not a whole lot of fat there around to, to show you that fat layer being cleared off. But again, just making sure that you, you can see your linea well so that you can close your linea well is, is very important. And then I took this picture um, today. Uh, this is a caudal abdominal approach for a cystotomy um, in, a, in a little puppy dog that had a urethral obstruction. And I don't know if y'all can tell, but even way the heck back there, the spleen was right there. So, you know, if I had gone in, you know, willy nilly thinking, you know, we're in the back of the abdomen, I don't have much to worry about, the bladder is empty, so on and so forth, I very well could have lacerated the spleen. So this is a perfect example today of why we tent and we go in carefully and we extend and we look around and we make sure that there's not a big spleen or a big mass or an adhesion that could be present to, um, you know, potentially cause a problem, turns a routine cystotomy into a full abdominal explorer and a splenectomy and, you know, increases our complication rate and everything else. So, so you know, this incision is actually notably small, even for me, um, it ended up getting enlarged because, you know, I couldn't even get my hand in this incision, but I wanted to go ahead and get that picture. Um, so this in incision ended up being bigger so I could really evaluate the spleen and evaluate, you know, everything within the mid to cranial abdomen as well. So now that we've got the abdomen open, uh, it's time to do our do our explore. Um, again, just like everything in this presentation, there's no right way or wrong way to do it. 
Um, this is just kind of my thought press as I, I go through it. And it's important that we all develop our own. Um, I would encourage you to develop a process and write it down. And if you need to take another OR with you 10 times, 15 times until it's committed to long-term memory and you do it the exact same way every time, you know, take it with you. There's no shame in having a having a cheat sheet in the operating room with you. Um, I still take anatomy textbooks in the OR with me when I'm making difficult approaches to the humerus, for example. I'm making sure that I'm refreshing on the, the regional anatomy um, and vessels and things. So, um, you know, developing a method, writing it down and, you know, having it as reference is, is definitely a good thing. So my general approach is the first thing I do, make a nice big incision, clean off the falciform, get into the abdomen fully. I remove the fat of the falciform. Um, you know, there's real no, no need to keep it in. It's just uh, in the way. Um, really, it's avascular structure. There's typically a decent vessel all the way at the cranial aspect where it's kind of attached to the xiphoid and the diaphragm. So in larger dogs, sometimes just digitally breaking it down and uh, then ligating the base is fine. Um, if you have cautery, you can just cauterize the whole thing off and it works really well. I'm not the hugest fan of Balfour's. Um, I'm generally working with an assistant who's able to help me with retraction and uh, visualization. But if you're working by yourself, like most of you probably are, Balfour's are invaluable. Um, resist the urge to dive right in to what you think the problem is. Uh, you know, if you're going in after a foreign body, don't just go straight digging for the foreign body. Um, if you're going in for a splenic mass, don't go straight in for the mass, um, unless that's your normal, you know, every single time you look at the spleen first, for example. Sometimes when you open the abdomen, you have no choice. You know, there's a huge splenic mass and <laughs> you can't really do anything until you get the splenic mass out of there. So, again, there's always room for variation, but in a, you know, kind of a standard approach kind of way, this is how I do it again. Um, I start by great, retracting the greater omentum uh, cranially, so just grabbing that greater omentum and gently teasing it cranially until I can find the window so I can actually get to the intestines. Uh, I essentially grab the first loop of intestines that I can, and I just go one direction all the way to the end. So I happen to end up at the ilium and then the cecum and then the colon. That's great. And then I just go the other way all the way to the jejunum and duodenum and stomach. Um, I think it's important to, you know, stem to stern the intestines first, uh, just because that's that's what I like to do. And then once I get there, I then will start cranial to caudal. So I'll check out, you know, my, my diaphragm. Um, I'll check out my liver, gallbladder, common bile duct, you know, kind of visualizing and palpating, um, especially if there's anything abnormal. Um, you know, the, co the common bile duct is, is important in you know gallbladder surgery but even in um foreign body obstructions and anorectic patients you know it's important to make sure that the common bile duct is patent and simply giving the gallbladder a good squeeze is is sufficient unless you're literally doing gallbladder surgery um i'll palpate the stomach again the stomach is large and it can be fluid filled or it can be air filled and uh, it's a it's a big space, so it's important to really do a thorough examination of the stomach. And um, I think probably the the hardest uh, part of the explore is to to feel confident about you know okay there's nothing in the stomach, especially if it is a foreign body. Then I work down the left side of the animal. I go for the spleen, um, and then what I've done essentially during the first part of my explore has been able to pack my left abdominal retractor. So if you remember your anatomic retractors are on the left, the descending duodenum. So utilizing your descending duodenum to create a curtain and packing all your small intestines in there. Then you can pull that towards midline and you can visualize the kidney beautifully. Um, the adrenals, you know, there's a lot of perianal fat. I'm not digging for adrenals, um, you know, unless I'm suspecting an adrenal problem. Most of the time we can see them, um, but if there's a lot of perirenal fat, you know, if there's a problem there, you should be able to see it. And so, you know, don't go bluntly dissecting perirenal fat, trying to find an adrenal, especially if you're in there for a foreign body or a cystotomy or something. Same thing with the ureters. Ureters are normally retroperitoneal. So, you know, just visualizing them if you can, um, again, paying special attention if it is a, you know, urinary case, for example. Ovary at present, uh, making sure that that's normal, um, uterine horn as well, and then caudally towards the bladder. And then on the right, your descending duodenum. Your descending duodenum is your anatomic retractor on the right. So packing all of your intestines in that, retracting it medially. Then you can check out the right kidney, the right adrenal. Um, 
reproductive tract if it's present. And then uh, one, one thing that's difficult to, to remember is the regional lymph nodes. So, you know, throughout the process, if there's an abnormality, most of the time it's easier to spot. But again, sometimes you do have to go looking for those gastric lymph nodes, those mesenteric lymph nodes, iliac lymph nodes are all important to visualize, especially when working with a potentially neoplastic process. You want to you take a look at all of those things. So, you know, we've done our full explore and now what? So now we got to start thinking about how we're going to fix the problem. And that's where we get into the meat of some of the various processes we'll talk about. But, um, you know, one of the things that's important when you're going to be a, doing surgery is knowing your suture and uh, knowing what you're going to do, because hopefully 99% of the time you get in there, you're going to be cutting something out. Um, and when you cut something out, it normally involves suture. So uh, I think it's important to be familiar with the suture that you have on the shelf. Um, this is a table from uh, Tobias and Johnston that just talks about common sutures and you know, are they monofilaments? Or are they braided? Talks about tensile strength over time. Um, you know, do you need a suture that's going to be present for two weeks, like a monocryl that loses 50% of its tensile strength over two weeks? Or do you need something that's going to last a little longer, like a PDS that's going to take six weeks to lose its 50% uh, of its tensile strength? So, you know, knowing how your suture is going to react, knowing what it's made of, knowing what to expect from your suture is, is incredibly important to helping helping guide your success. So, you know, I encourage all of you to be familiar with, you know, outside of just this is absorbable, this is not absorbable, you know, taking a little time to, you know, familiarize yourself with the sutures that you have and, you know, the, the characteristics of that suture. So speaking of suture, next question is, um, you know, what is the most common abdominal procedure that you guys are performing other than spay? So um, we'll give you guys a few seconds to try to think about you know, what's, what are you doing in your practice um, most commonly? All right, great. So uh, pretty, pretty much uh, cystotomies and enterotomies are um, making up roughly 90% uh, of what you guys are doing um, in practice. A couple folks picked every single option up there, but cystotomies and enterotomies um, by far and away the, the, the biggest there. So um, that's, you know, we're going to talk about both of those things today. So hopefully some helpful points for you. Um, some more suture, you know, selection generalities. Suture larger is not always better. Um, much larger suture will tear through tissue before it will break. Um, so you got to think about, you know, the smallest suture to do the job you need it to do. Um, and also there's, uh, you know, studies out there that show that a smaller suture with more frequent bites is actually stronger than a larger suture with less bites. So, you know, keep that in mind that just because, uh, you know, in this, just because, you're used to closing, you know, an abdomen. You don't need to use a alt PDS on a on a Yorkie. Um, I'm sure none of you are, but you know that's just an example to size match your your suture for the the task at hand. And we'll talk specifically about other procedures where it's a little more uh, appropriate to to do so. Taper, taper, taper. 99% of your suture usage should be a taper. Um, anytime you're doing anything in the abdomen, uh, anytime you're going through any tissues within the abdomen, the linea, the sub-Q, uh, taper is the preferred uh, suture because it creates a, a smaller defect in the needle itself, whereas the cutting needles end up leaving a little bit of room around the suture itself um, on a microscopic level. The only time I ever use anything that's not a taper is in my final skin layer. Um, so when I'm using a intradermal pattern, for example, or if I'm just closing with a, a ethylon or just doing my final skin layer, is the only time that I'm using a cutting needle. Um, every other time, every other scenario, it's going to be a, a taper needle. So keeping that in mind, as long as as well as with your uh, suture characteristics, is your is your needle type and how that's going to affect you know everything that's being done. By far and away, time and time again, suture showed that most of the time a continuous is as good, if not better, than interrupted sutures. That doesn't always mean that a continuous is best. And at the end of the day, we have to decide what's going to make us sleep easier at night. 
but uh, most of the time, a continuous has, is really a good option to utilize in a very safe way and a, you know a more efficient way than a you know interrupteds would be. Monofilament for me, no question. Uh, monofilament, 99% of the time. The only time I use a braided suture is uh, when I'm ligating a PDA. You know, and that's silk. Um, so I'm not a fan of Vicryl, especially in any type of GI surgery. You know, braided suture. Last thing you want to do is pass that through a lumen. And again, braided sutures wick. So we don't want to even give those bacteria an easy route if we can. Uh, monofilament creates less drag typically um, than than our poly polyfilaments do. So um, you know, picking suture. You know, I'm um, generally if I had to have it, some kind of monofilament on a taper point is going to be what we use by far and away um, most of the time. So on that vein, you know, what is your guys' favorite suture? So if you had to have one suture on the shelf, you know, what would you pick? And these are more of the more common brands that uh, we've come across. Um, you know, all of these are listed on that reference a couple couple slides back. Um, so, so just kind of seeing what everybody out there is using, what everybody out there likes. All right, excellent. So we got PDS and monocryl. 63% um, of you like PDS and 34% of you like monocryl and 2% of you like caprosin. So I am 100% in agreement with you guys that by far and away, uh, PDS is my go-to. Um, I use PDS and I use PDS in 100% of my surgeries, I'll tell you that. Um, I most often use uh, a monocryl for my final skin layer intradermal. Um, so, but but PDS for me is by far and away the nice middle road in terms of lasting long enough for, for complete healing, even in patients that may have delayed healing, um, as well as having nice uh, responsiveness, ease of use, doesn't get too much memory to it. Uh, every now and then it does, but um, so I think my PDS is by far and away my favorite. So I think, you know, now might be a good time to take a pause and see if there's any questions that have come through yet, uh, just kind of leading up to the acts of various procedures. Um, you know, we talked about a lot of getting started stuff. Are there any specific questions on anything leading up to actual surgery? So far, I do not have any questions in the chat or the Q&A. Great. So if you think of any, again, don't hesitate to, to reach out. So now we'll get into what you're probably all here for most is the actual specifics on um, many of the procedures that, you know, you guys are, are doing in hospital. And we'll get to enterotomies and cystotomies as well. Um, we just got to open gastropexy first. So for an open gastropexy, um, you know, most often this is done in an emergent situation, you know, if a patient has a GDV, but we also are doing hopefully a lot of these prophylactically in our larger deep chested dogs. Um, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of cure. So, you know, being able to be comfortable with this type of procedure on a prophylactic basis when you're doing your spays and neuters, I think is invaluable. So there's many types of gastropexies, incisional being the most common, which I believe most of us are probably um, most comfortable with. Other options are belt loop, which is creating a flap in the in the tissue and a whole belt loop thing. It's a big deal. Um, it's kind of annoying and I don't recommend doing it if you don't have to. Circumcostal is going around the ribs. Um, the risk of that is creating a pneumo inadvertently. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's not superior to incisional or belt loop. Uh, incorporating is when you close it into the incision itself, and I strongly advise against that. Um, you know, you're setting up the next person that might have to go in there for trouble. Um, you're also setting up a weird anatomy variation that may not be well tolerated for the patient. And then gastrocolopexy, um, where you actually suture the, the stomach to the transverse colon, which is kind of a weird concept. I've never done it. Um, there's not a lot of literature on it, but it is reported out there. Again, I'm a fan of incisional gastropexy. And anytime I'm working in the intestine um, or in the abdomen, I essentially have a 10 blade ready and a 15 blade ready. Uh, 10 blade to get into the abdomen, and then it goes away. And then anytime I'm making any fresh cuts in the abdomen, I'm using a 15 blade. Um, I like to use a number seven handle, which is on the, the bottom there. It's a longer, skinnier handle. 
gives you a little bit of a better reach um, when you're trying to get down deep to make your incision into the transverse abdominis, for example. Um, but uh, I like the 15 blade on a number seven handle. Your gastropexies should be four to six centimeters. Um, and you know, for most things, it should be on the right side. It should be the near the pyloric antrum, but not over the pylorus. Um, we don't want to, you know, alter the pylorus and uh, create a create a problem that way. So on the pyloric antrum, um, essentially just somewhere away from the significant vasculature. Um, and then, then unfortunately, in your prophylactic gastropexies, these are typically going to be a little more difficult than after a GDV because the stomach hasn't been stretched, hasn't been dilated. You might actually have to put a little tension on the stomach to get it to a nice anatomic place. Um, try to think about how the patient's going to be when they're standing. Um, the stomach is pretty well fixed in place. So, you know, it's not like when they're standing up, their belly is now hanging down to their ventral midline. Um, but trying to think about, you know, when things are shifted to a standing position. I typically will use an op PDS with two continuous lines. Um, one continuous suture has been shown to be as effective as two in mechanical studies. Um, a lot of people feel better just suturing the, the one side and then suturing the other with two separate lines. Um, but again, a single continuous incorporating it all into one, one suture has been shown to be as effective as multiple, multiple lines. The most common mistake when making a pexy is to make it too ventral. Um, the more ventral it is, the closer it is to your incision, and that makes it easier on you, which makes it harder on the animal because it's less anatomically normal. Um, pulling it close to the to the incision line or even to the incision line itself, which is strongly advised against, uh, can create you know more harsh anatomic turns. Can create a little bit of uh, they they believe that most of the time when animals have persistent regurgitation or reflux or GI signs after gastropexy, that it is related to the the pexy becoming too ventral. So. It's more difficult, it's harder, especially when you're by yourself, but again, trying to keep your pexy site dorsal and anatomically normal is, is important to hopefully prevent any complications. Um, you know, location, anywhere caudal to the diaphragm, just to, you know, typically that's gonna be, you know, the 11th, 12th rib. Um, if you if you're too close to the diaphragm, you'll cause a pneumothorax, and that can be life-threatening, especially if you don't pick up on it. Um, so making sure that you visualize the diaphragm through your nice big incision and making your incision caudal to that. Um, whether you make your incision vertically, horizontally, parallel to the ribs doesn't matter too much as long as your incisions match and are anatomic. I like to make my incisions um, parallel to the rib and you gotta make sure you get through the transverse abdominis. So don't just kind of go through the peritoneum, create a little separation, a little bit of bleeding. Um, you know, that's not gonna create as, as effective of an adhesion as going through the transverse abdominis. Um, and there's multiple other uh, muscle planes there. You got your internal abdominal oblique, external abdominal oblique, so you're not gonna create a hernia. So make sure you get a, a good, good, bite into your transverse abdominis when you're when you're doing so again again the most common mistake is creating the pexy tube ventral um because it makes it easier for you so be sure to perform your pexy dorsal try to maintain as normal anatomy as possible and when you're closing make sure you close the harder part first um, meaning you want to close the deep cranial part of the incision before closing the incision closest to you so if you close the incision line closest to you first, then you got to work around the stomach. You got to pull the stomach out of the way. Um, so keeping that in mind when you're performing a gastropexy to start dorsally and cranially as far as getting your, your suture lines together. Laparoscopically, um, I should have put a question in here to ask if any of you guys were doing laparoscopic procedures. Um, you can do full laparoscopic or lap assisted. Uh, it is a minimally invasive technique. Um, you know, there's twice the rate of complication in a single port versus a multi port. Um, so utilizing a multi port just allows better um, instrument use, more, uh, more convenient camera angles, better visualization. So, um, you know, multi port is preferred at this point. I'm sure that may change as more people use single port um, and that technique gets defined. 
oftentimes it takes a whole lot longer and is a lot more frustrating um, for the for the user than just uh, doing it open. Um, and that comes with use. If I were to pick up a laparoscope right now, it would probably take me three hours to do a uh, gastropexy, whereas we can open them, do it, and close them in you know 45 minutes the old-fashioned way. But uh, laparoscopic procedures are extremely enticing to owners, uh, the minimally invasive things. They think about how they would want it done to themselves. Um, so I think there is a, a huge market for you know learning this technique um, and uh, offering it to our to our clients. It does require specialized equipment. Um, if you're going to do fully laparoscopic uh, to do a lap assisted, you actually have to make an incision on the outside of the body, caudal to the rib, through all the muscle layers, which are the external, internal, abdominal, oblique, and transverse abdominis, um, to actually open up the abdomen to then make your gastropexy through there and then close each of your muscle layers separately. Um, so it does still require a, a full thickness incision, you know, for that, for that gastropexy. Um, if you're gonna do it fully laparoscopically, special suture, barb suture is necessary. And 100% of dogs had an intact pexy six months post. So again, it is a very effective um, technique, but uh, unless it's something you're doing very routinely, could be an extreme headache. Uh, for example, if I were to try to do one again, uh, probably wouldn't be pretty right now. So now getting into, you know, more GI surgery. At best, GI surgeries are considered clean contaminated. Um, anytime you open up viscera, you are exposing the environment to microbes. Uh, we do our best to minimize it, but at best, we are doing a clean contaminated procedure. So it's very important to isolate the area of interest when doing GI surgery with moist and laparotomy sponges. Um, it's important to protect the viscera from air and to keep them moist. So what we don't want to do is create intestines or other things that are dried out. Um, that's going to lead to more adhesion formation. So keeping those things tucked in the belly nicely, or if you need to pull them out to uh, have them out of the way so you can work better in the belly, um, keeping, you know, keeping them covered with wet laparotomy sponges and that's a key part for your assistant if you have one is making sure that, you know, there's not a section of intestine hanging out, drying out like an old, like an old worm. Um, be sure that your impermeable layer is intact. Wicking is the enemy. So making sure that you have a, a very appropriately draped off area, making sure that if you're using impermeable um, draping material, at least one layer of it, uh, because again, as you're starting to wet everything, you know, to keep things protected, uh, you don't want to start wicking, you know, bacteria, contaminants from the periphery um, to your surgery site. Gentle tissue handling is a must and minimal handling, you know, do the bare minimum that you can in terms of manipulation. Um, this will help decrease inflammation and adhesion formation. Um, when possible, remove the area of interest from the abdominal cavity. So if you're able to uh, remove the jejunum and do all of the enterotomy outside of the body, that's best. Um, if you can't, again, trying to isolate and pack it, for example, the stomach. Um, if you're doing a gastrotomy, trying to isolate and pack that stomach if you're not able to fully you know, get it out of the abdomen. Pool suction is a must. Uh, Got to have the pool suction. Again, fresh blades. So anytime you're cutting into abdominal viscera, a fresh blade is imperative. Again, I like to use a 15 blade um, when I'm using um, any type of abdominal surgery and GI surgery and sharp medicine bombs. Remember, um, a lot of us like to complain about scissors, but a lot of us like to use scissors inappropriately. So make sure that you're using the right scissor for the task at hand. Uh, make sure that you're not cutting suture with your nice medicine bombs. Make sure that your medicine bombs are staying sharp because uh, utilizing dull equipment on any level is just going to increase your rate of complication. Um, so being familiar with your with your scissors and what you have and using the right one for the job is imperative. Keeping the sold sponges removed um, is very appropriate and making sure we're keeping track. Uh, I didn't mention um, I should have, but you know doing an accurate sponge count in the beginning is imperative and then at the end. So uh, making sure that you're keeping all of your sponges in a pile on the floor somewhere um, away from the trash can. Remove the trash can from the OR as we, we typically do um, so that we can do a thorough, you know, sponge count before and after. Um, you know, no one's left a sponge behind on purpose, I promise you. So, um, you know, again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So um, 
keeping those soiled sponges removed when appropriate. Change your gloves before closure. So once you've gotten through all the clean contaminated part, you've done your surgery, you've got them flushed, you know, change your gloves, flush some more, um, trying to keep everything as, as clean and sterile as possible. And then again, any abdominal procedure, doesn't matter what it is for me, gastropexy, gastrotomy, enterotomy, anything we're going to talk about, uh, I always perform at least a single lavage to help decrease contamination, um, help make sure everything is good and moist in there. Um, there's, there's no studies that show that it's going to decrease adhesion formation or anything like that, but I, I do like to make sure that we give everything a good good wash down um, after surgery just to, to help everything be in, in good shape. Um, of course, if you have some kind of contamination and lots of lavage, but if everything is clean and kosher, you know, a single fill the belly and suction it out is very appropriate. Um, so another question, um, you know, for GI surgeries, do you routinely put your post-ops on uh, antibiotics? Um, you know, assuming it's a clean contaminated procedure. All right, excellent. So we got about 60% of you do not, and about 40% of you do. Um, I am also in the do not group. Um, you know, microbial stewardship is a, is a huge thing uh, these days. And um, if there's not a reason of, to put something on an antibiotic, then I encourage you not to. If there's a reason, yes, please do. But if you did a, a clean procedure and you controlled your contamination, and other than being on the safe side, you know, reconsider um, whether you would utilize an antibiotic or not for these guys. So further on, um, gastrotomy. So gastropexy first, now we'll talk about gastrotomy. For gastrotomies, um, you know, most often we are removing a foreign body. Um, incising pretty much wherever is kind of convenient away from the great vessels and uh, typically in the greater curvature of the fundus is where you're going to make your incision. Again, I use a 15 blade, uh, essentially cutting through the, um, you know, seromuscularis first. And stay sutures are your friend. Um, 2 -0 or 3 -0 PDS stay sutures for the board of your gastrotomy. 15 blade, again, on a seven handle, single incision in the seromuscularis. So something that's important for us to all help um, our patients with, with he healing is being able to make single incisions that are effective. We don't want to make four or five small nicks and cuts in the seromuscularis. We'd like to be able to make a single nice smooth uh, incision. That's the appropriate length and depth. And the only thing that's going to allow that to happen is practice. Um, but, you know, trying to find that balance of the appropriate pressure to get through that first layer is, is pretty important. And honestly, it's pretty hard to go all the way through the mucosa of the stomach with a single single swipe of the blade. Um, you can be fairly aggressive, you know, with your, you know, first swipe of the blade and, you know, just get through the seromuscularis. But once I get through the seromuscularis and I've exposed the gastrotomy site um, well, I'll make a stab incision uh, just big enough for the pool suction tip to get in. Um, if there's fluid, air, what have you, that goes in there. That instrument is now contaminated. So, keep it safe, keep it, you know, away from more sterile parts, but you can't throw it away just yet. Once I've adequately closed the stomach, I will then extend the incision, the length of the seromuscularis incision with Mets and Bombs. Um, again, I'm a big fan of extending incisions with Mets and Bombs, um, you know, once I've gotten my, my full thickness. And again, it's important to have nice sharp Mets and Bombs to cut tissue and not crush tissue. Generally then, you know, I'll use an Alice tissue or another instrument to remove the foreign body. Um, thorough palpation, again, incredibly important, thorough palpation of the entire stomach, all the way from the esophagus, greater curvature, down and around, lesser curvature, pylorus. And uh, once I remove the foreign body from the stomach, I will commonly actually pass a finger through the pylorus um, in appropriately sized animals, which is most, um, to make sure there's not something hiding, you know, in that, in that pylorus because, um, you know, Again, the last thing any of us want to do is leave something behind. So thorough palpation externally and internally. Again, remember, you're going to be changing your gloves um, soon. Um, it's also important to remember that the microbial content of the stomach is very low. 
Um, so, you know, it's not like cutting open the colon and rubbing your finger around in it. Um, you know, the microbial contents of the stomach are extremely low. So even, you know, palpating everything thoroughly, making sure you don't get anything left behind, giving your hands a good rinse with some saline and, you know, towel, towel dry, um, you know, that's very reasonable to do as you're starting to close before your final blood change. Um, and again, considering actually palpating that pylorus, um, if there's any question um, if that's fully patent or not is, is important. Gastrotomy closure, generally two layers. Um, again, here I'm a PDS fan, uh, generally 3-0. So this is where the size match is appropriate. Um, so even in, you know, somewhat larger dogs, if, if the stomach is, you know, relatively petite, I'll use a 3-0 PDS. And, you know, large and giant dogs, I will reach for a 2-0 PDS, but, you know, by far and away, most of the time, 3-0 PDS is appropriate. First layer is a continuous in the mucosa, making sure to start and end past the commissures of the incision. Um, again, a simple continuous, watertight, very effective. Second layer, uh, continuous is fine. Just a simple appositional is great. Um, a lot of people like to do an inverting pattern, such as a Cushing or a Limpert or other techniques, and that's great. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's lovely. It makes you feel good about yourself. Um, but either way, you know, leakage rates are less than one to two percent um, with a two-layer closure of the stomach. And, you know, there are some some studies about single layer closure of the stomach being just as effective as well, but um, I'm not brave enough to try that one yet. Um, I will definitely continue using a two layer closure in the stomach. And again, I generally I do a, a single continuous followed by a cushing. Again, it looks nice. It looks pretty, has the sutures. Um, so, so I like to do that. Even if I'm able to keep my surgery site pristine, I continue with an abdominal flush. If, even if there's no contamination. And then typically, like I said, fill the abdomen once and suction as dry as possible um, before considering changing gloves and stuff like that. So now on to one of the most common procedures you guys are performing, um, the enterotomy. The enterotomy is by far and away mostly done because of a foreign body. Um, there is a greater complication risk than a gastrotomy. Dehiscence rates range from seven to 16 plus percent depending on the study. And interestingly, uh, biopsy leakage rates are typically a little bit higher, you know, 12 to 15%. So um, if you're doing GI biopsies, unfortunately, you're probably working with somewhat of a disease tissue. Um, so it makes sense that leakage rates are higher, but these are the types of things that are important to talk with your owners about, um, you know, dehiscence rates being this, and even in the perfect, perfect scenario, you know, whether it's me or you or first year vet student, um, you know, these dehiscence rates are, they are what they are and none of us are perfect. So it is important to discuss these types of numbers with owners, um, to give them a realistic expectation. Again, a fresh 15 blade and aboral meaning towards the rectum um, of the foreign body. Typically the tissues in front of or towards the stomach or ad are going to be edematous, swollen, erythematous, and not as quite a beautiful healthy tissue as that that hasn't been messed up by the foreign body yet. So typically again, going for a beautiful section of normal looking intestines at boral. Um, 15 blade, again, I'll typically extend the incision with medicine bombs. It's important to make your enterotomy large enough to remove the foreign body without tearing the serosa or the mucosa. Um, there are no studies that show that a one millimeter incision are, is going to leak less than a one centimeter incision. So, you know, again, making your incisions appropriate size to get the job done without creating um, damage is important. You know, you don't want to take a corn cob out of a one centimeter incision and then you've got serosal tearing on both sides and then you're trying to decide should you do a serosal patch, should you try to repair just a serosa, you know, just go ahead and make a nice healthy enterotomy and it's going to be less damaged and your leakage rates are still going to be the same as if you were to try to squeeze it out of a tiny one. Um, always on the anti-mesenteric side. So, you know, again, a lot of this seems simple, but um, just trying to, you know, tell you how, how the things are going through my mind. So the anti-mesenteric side away from the vessels. Um, and then one big thing is to think about worst case scenario. Um, what are you going to do if this surgery site leaks? Um, is there a way to plan your enterotomy 
in such a way that should it leak and should you have to come back and do a resection and anastomosis, you know, is that going to be a viable option? Um, so, you know, trying to do an enterotomy, you know, in the, you know, proximal duodenum, you know, that's, that's something you got to think about what's going to happen if this leaks. Um, can you maybe move that foreign body safely somewhere else? Are you just dealt a crappy hand and it's all you got? That's fine. But, um, you know, thinking about that, especially if you are going to be doing GI biopsies, for example, um, you know, trying to plan your enterotomies in, a, in such a way that there's a fail safe or you're going to have a good chance should it lead to do an RNA in that region. Um, so that's that's something to consider whenever you're planning your RNA, you know, trying to make sure you're in good healthy tissue and trying to decide, you know, is this going to be a minimal to resection should it leak because we've all had all had them leak. Um, so so keep that in mind. One of the tough things about enterotomies are they're commonly done in the mid to distal duodenum. Um, reason being that, you know, pelvic flexure where the duodenum makes a sharp turn and has the duodenal colic ligament, uh, that creates a bottleneck that a lot of foreign bodies will get stuck at. So it is very safe to break down the entire duodenal colic ligament. And there's a picture of the duodenal colic ligament as it attaches to the transverse, the transverse uh, colon. The biggest thing that you have to be very careful for is the vasculature. The middle colic does run through the duodenal colic ligament. So if you were to damage that inadvertently, you could kill half of the colon. So when you're breaking down the duodenal colic ligament, make sure that you are staying as close to the duodenum as you can. Typically, you can stretch this out and it's paper thin and you can see the vessels very well. Um, having an extra set of hands is imperative for, for working down in that region. Um, so, and then again, sometimes you're not able to visualize those things well without breaking down the duodenal colic ligament. So when necessary, don't be afraid to break down the duodenal colic ligament. Again, utilizing, you know, sharp dissection, blunt dissection, monopolar cautery, visualizing everything very well and just avoiding that colic vasculature that, that's running through. Um, and again, it'll make your life a lot easier. It's very scary the first few times you do it. Um, it's still scary sometimes, to be honest with you, especially when it's a fatty animal and your visualization isn't great and the duodenal colic ligament is broader than normal. Um, so so that's that's tough. But, uh, you know, good visualization and, and break it down if you have to, to allow better access for you, allows you to do a better surgery, um, allows you to feel a lot better about your suture placement. Um, so, so don't be afraid to break down that duodenal colic ligament if you have to. Every enterotomy I do, I close with 4 OPDS on the taper. Um, doesn't matter if it's a Great Dane or Chihuahua. Um, you know, this is again one of those things where using a 3 O or a 2 O or a hot or what have you, you know, isn't going to increase your chances of keeping it together. Um, those tissues are very delicate, and um, you know, a 4 OPDS is going to hold um, and a, a 2 -O PDS is just going to tear through the serosa, you know, if something were to happen. So 4 -O PDS on a taper, um, regardless of patient size for me, for all of my enterotomies. Interrupted sutures make me feel better, but again, studies have shown that continuous performs just as well. I have started incorporating some continuous suture patterns for my enterotomies, um, especially when it's, you know, beautiful, healthy tissue that I'm very confident in. Um, so, so keeping that in mind, you know, if you're doing continuous, good for you, Congrat great. Um, if you're using interrupteds, it makes you feel better, use the interrupteds, but know that, you know, continuous, a well-placed continuous is, is just as effective as the uh, interrupted sutures. Tobias will tell you, you know, three to five millimeters of depth and three to five millimeters apart. I am not that brave. Um, most of the GI surgery, I'm, I'm utilizing surgical loops with a light source and magnification. And I'm, my bites are typically, you know, two millimeters by two millimeters, if that. Um, you, know, you know, the old saying goes, one, one suture for every night you want to sleep well. So um, I, I disagree with the three to five millimeters of depth and three to five millimeters apart. Um, I'm sure a lot of you may be doing similar things with very good success, but it makes me very nervous and I like to utilize a, a much more uh, petite uh, suture structure. Again, studies have shown that, you know, smaller, more frequent bites are 
overall, you know, better at you know leakage pressures and um, failure rates and things like that. So um, I don't use any patching techniques routinely. A mental patch is cirrhosal passage. Um, you know, I'll I'll take the momentum and throw it on the surgery site, um, which the body's going to do naturally anyway. Um, you know, half the time when I finish my enterotomy, if I got to go to do do something else, a gastroepexy or a splenectomy or what have you, by the time I go back to my final explore, you know, the momentum has already wrapped itself all the way around that enterotomy site. So I don't do any patching with sutures and stuff. I just kind of lay it there and let the body do what it does naturally. Again, even with no contamination, I'm going to flush that abdomen, um, even if it's jejunal and I can pull everything out of the abdomen and zero contamination, you know, I'm still going to flush the abdomen. Um, with a, if I do have a lot of contamination, then I'm a much, lot more aggressive. You know, if I'm working, for example, the, I had to do a duodenal RNA last week. Um, you know, I was not able to fully expose the duodenum from the um, abdominal cavity, even after breaking down the duodenal cold ligament. So, you know, there was a little bit of contamination and we had to, uh, you know, flush, flush, flush to make, to hopefully get rid of all those contaminants. So. Um, local lavage and, you know, general lavage. Uh, as far as culture goes, you know, I don't routinely culture, um, especially if there's some kind of contamination that's my fault. Um, if it's the second time going in a septic belly, yeah, I'll culture, but, you know, pretty much any GI surgery, um, if I'm not going in because of some kind of GI abscess or something, it's, uh, I'm not going to typically culture even if there is contamination. So since that was the most common, um, one of the most common procedures performed. Does anybody have any specific questions about, you know, enterotomies um, at this point, Paige? I do not have any, any for you right now. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on. Here we go. Um, I have one question. Even when you know there is contamination, would you still elect not to administer antibiotics? Not yes. Yeah. So if there is contamination and I caused it, then I will not use antibiotics postoperatively. Um, you know, if I'm able to, even like I, that last week, for example, you know, there was contamination um, and I did not elect to use postoperative antibiotics on that patient um, and that patient's doing well uh, even today. So, so if, even if there is contamination, if I feel that I can do a good job with my flushing to, um, you know, decontaminate the area, then, then I will not utilize antibiotics. Great. And then one, just a little, you're doing a great job because it says not a question, just a comment. So many great tips. <laughs> well, well, thank you. So thank, thank you. Um, hopefully a, a few more helpful ones coming. So now to many people's biggest fears, uh, interectomy or resection and anastomosis. Um, again, an even higher complication rate than a enterotomy because a much, much more major surgery, um, you know, one that makes us all probably lose a little bit of sleep for a few days. Um, most commonly due to devitalized tissue from a foreign body passing through, damaging the, um, you know, mesenteric side. Could also be from a GI mass or an interception, you know, that is perforated or ruptured or uh, just a mass that's present. Uh, just for your information, mass margin recommendations, should you get into that situation, maybe you think it's a foreign body or into susception and dang on, it's a mass in there. The recommendation for the small intestines is three centimeters on either side of the mass. Um, so keep that in mind if you do run across that, you know, getting a good three centimeter margin on either side is, is the current recommendation. Um, the mesenteric border of the enterectomy site should be slightly longer than anti-mesenteric site meaning, you know, cut away from the, the mesenteric. And I have a picture to show that here in just a second. Um, and always paying incredibly close attention to your vascular supply. Um, the intestines will show devitalization rapidly. So as you are deciding your resection margins, you know, make your ligatures and wait, you know, give it a minute. And those tissues are going to become gray and dark extremely rapidly and there's often just this beautiful line of demarcation um, that's going to show you you know where your healthy border is so once you you know ligate everything that you're going to remove 
give it a minute or two and the body's going to show you the, the perfect location to make your cuts. Um, again, when I'm doing a hand sewn or section and anastomosis for OPDS on a taper, again, it doesn't matter if it's a Great Dane or a, or a, or a Yorkie. Um, the five to seven sutures on the mesenteric border, so on the side of the vasculature, are tied first and they're tied within the lumen. That way you can visualize the, the sutures and these are arguably the most important. So these are the sutures that on the mesenteric side are gonna be the hardest to actually uh, determine um, you know, good location for because once you get it closed up and you start closing everything else, when you come back around, uh, it's gonna be really hard for you to visualize those sutures. So getting those five to seven sutures on the mesenteric side are extremely important um, and you know, very, make sure they're good healthy bites, make sure they're good healthy sutures. And again, a four OPDS on the taper, um, is, it would be my recommendation. People talk about repairing the defect in the mesentery. Um, it depends on the size. Uh, and that goes for pretty much any hole anywhere. Uh, if you have an umbilical hernia, if you have a subxiphoid hernia, if you have any type of you know, defect, truthfully, the bigger, the better, um, because bigger defects don't cause entrapment. Bigger defects don't cause strangulation. So if you remove a huge section of intestines and your mesenteric defect is, you know, big enough to fit your arm through, you know, you probably don't have to close it. Um, you can definitely close it if it makes you feel better. Um, but if it's, if it's large and you don't have any concerns, um, you know, you don't have to. Uh, if it's a smaller resection, you know, just a couple of in inches of intestine, you're worried that maybe some intestines could fold on themselves and work their way in there, twist on themselves, and then cause a problem, absolutely. Or if you just want to negate that altogether, then close every one. That is perfectly fine. You do have to be extremely careful when closing the, uh, the defect because most often your border on either side is essentially a nice, healthy vessel. And what you don't want to do is damage that vessel um, and then compromise blood flow to your fresh resection and anastomosis site. Um, so everything comes as a risk reward, you know, scenario analogy. So um, extreme care should be used when you are, you know, repairing those uh, mesenteric defects and a simple continuous, again, is the, is the way to go typically. Um, again, being careful not to damage or entrap the blood supply, which could then, you know, compromise your intestinal repair. Um, side note, if I can use a GIA and a TA stapler for a resection and osmosis, I do. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have stapling equipment. Uh, stapling equipment, if you have it, is excellent. Um, as far as leakage rates, um, they are the same with a hand sewn and a stapling device with the exception of a septic environment. So if you are working in a septic environment, uh, stapling devices are superior in their, their leakage rates post-operatively, um, but for normal healthy tissue, a hand-sewn RNA is just as good as a stapling device. Um, but stapling devices are much faster, um, so when I can utilize them, I will. Um, and again, that's just a, probably not something many of you have access to, but if you do, um, it's excellent and can be used anytime you can use it, use it. Dr. Brady, we have a couple questions. Okay. Um, are you using antibiotics during surgery? Yes. Um, so one of the, the first slides I mentioned, um, cefazolin, 22 mg per kg, about 30 minutes before first incision, every 90 minutes throughout the procedure, and then a minimum of two doses follow up. Um, so, and that's, that's standard for almost every surgical patient I have. Um, changes are if I'm doing something in the gallbladder or liver, I'll use a, a more potent antibiotic. Um, but pretty much all of my surgery patients get about 24 hours of broad spectrum coverage. Thank you. For anyone that joined um, a little later, we will be sharing the PowerPoint when we send you your CE certificate um, as well. So some of the doses that he just rattled off will be included in that PowerPoint. Um, next question is, when there is significant contamination due to a perforation, do you ever add antibiotics to your abdominal lavage? Absolutely not. Um, great question. Uh, I do have a little blurb on that um, towards the end of the procedure uh, with a little bit of literature about that, but um, no. Okay. Next question is about your mesenteric suture placements. 
Are you saying that the knots of your mesenteric sutures are in the lumen of the intestine? Yes. Okay. When suctioning after a GI surgery, like after suctioning out the stomach, when are you switching to a sterile suction tip before lavaging the abdomen? Pretty much after my, my first lavage. Um, you know, once I'm, once I'm fully done with any risk of contamination. Um, so for example, for a gastrotomy, uh, if everything's beautiful and clean and no spillage, then I'm gonna go ahead and once I suction out the stomach, finish my gastrotomy, finish my explore, everything's looking good, then I will go ahead and switch out that suction tip. Um, if I have contamination, then I will lavage suction with the contaminated suction tip uh, a time or two and then get all new um, lavage tip and gloves and everything else after that. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, so um, going on to the, you know, enterectomy continuation, this is just a beautiful picture of some beautiful healthy intestines and you can see the vasculature uh, beautifully there. Um, so, so here is a, a line that essentially shows what I mean by saying that the, the mesenteric border should be longer than the anti-mesenteric border. So this line, as you can tell, is not going straight across the intestines. It is going at an angle away from the mesentery. And what that does is it helps pre preserve the vasculature of the anti-mesenteric side. Again, once you ligate these vessels, um, the intestines are going to show you beautifully a line of demarcation to help guide you, um, but always keeping that in mind. And sometimes, as I mentioned in a moment, utilizing that angle to your advantage because sometimes, especially when dealing with a foreign body that's leading to a resection and anastomosis, you have a significant size discrepancy. And there are a couple of techniques to um, accommodating that size discrepancy. Uh, the picture on the left is essentially just making an incision on the anti-mesenteric side of the smaller part. And again, once you get your mesenteric portion done very well, then you can essentially make a crotch suture on the anti-mesenteric side um, and make sure that your, your size is appropriate. Um, so that's a very Excuse me, that's a very simple method that I like to use. Um, again, when stapling, as I often do, you don't have to worry about that size discrepancy, which is nice. Um, the picture on the right shows actually closing down completely part of the lumen um, until the only thing that you have left is a size matched lumen. Um, this is a technique I really only utilize when performing a Bill Ross type one, um, where I'm removing the pylorus and then you have the entirety of the stomach attaching to the proximal duodenum. Um, so, so I routinely don't use this technique in the small intestine. Um, I prefer to make a incision on the anti-mesenteric border. But one thing you can also think about when you have a smaller um, size discrepancy is the angle at which you make your oblique cut. So going, let's see, can I go back? Yeah, so this angle here, you know, if you have it more, you know, more vertical, slightly angled, it's going to be a smaller diameter than if you make a more dramatic angle. So if you do have a size match, size mismatch, you can make, a, you know, a one side, you know, a more vertical, slightly angled incision, and then on the other side, make a more dramatic incision to try and create a similar uh, lumen size without having to make additional cuts in the, in the uh, intestines. And again, you know, Sharp, sharp, sharp's important. You know, have sharp mets and bombs if at all possible. Um, and again, I'm, I'm typically utilizing scissors to make make those adjustments there. So, speaking of RNAs, one of the common causes that we have to do are intussusception. Um, intussusceptions are interesting. Um, if you're able to treat the cause of the intussusception, for example, a foreign body or known intestinal parasitism, um, I'm not a fan of enteroplication. Um, and really, it, I'm never really going to do an enteroplication unless a patient fails um, without doing that, uh, 
enteroplication. For example, um, recurrence of intussusception in, in this study, you know, two out of 10 that got enteroplication versus zero out of six without. 85% um, of intussusceptions will end with an RNA. If you have an intussusception and you're able to reduce it um, and it's healthy tissue, you know, that's a, that's a tough decision for us to all make um, as to, you know, doing something to try to prevent another intussusception. Typically, intussusceptions will then occur or add to the current intussusception. Um, so, so intussusceptions are extremely interesting. And, you know, unfortunately, the, the better part of literature is, is leaning towards not doing enteroplication. Um, and to do enteroplication is extremely time consuming and it comes with a long list of morbidity. Uh, a, a high percentage of these animals are gonna have consistent GI signs. They're gonna have another uh, uh, intussusception. Um, you know, it's gonna take a ton of time and surgery. It's gonna alter the entire path of the GI tract. So, um, you know, that's a discussion you have to have with the owner of, of these risks and, you know, it's a lot easier when you can find the cause, you know, you get in there, you find the foreign body, and then you find an intussusception, you know, just distal to that, um, for example, or if you find a mass or, you know, something like that, that's caused an intussusception, you know, removing that, I'm not even thinking about anything additional other than a resection and anastomosis. When you have a young puppy that has a intussusception because of parasitism, you know, are you able to treat that parasitism concurrently and not have a, uh, and the recurrence, that's a that's a tough, tough balance. Fortunately, I haven't had any recurrence. Um, you know, that's you know, I've been lucky so far with the intussusceptions, but um, you know, my my general rule is to avoid enteroplication if at all possible. Dr. Brady, we have a question probably relating to the previous slide. Um, previous one, yeah. If you make the extra cut to widen the lumen of the smaller diameter side, do you then trim the corner created to make it easier to create good opposition? I do not. Um, you know, I'm trying to create as minimal damage to anything as possible. Um, so trying to, again, create a, a single incision, a single cut with the blade, um, and then just grabbing that, that, that crotch of the of the incision as shown in the lower part of this uh, picture here. I don't know if y'all can see my arrow or not. Um, so grabbing at that very corner and, and opposing there, um, I'm typically not trying to mess around any more than I have to with any of this delicate vasculature. Thank you. All righty. So when we start talking about removing intestines, we got to start thinking about how is this going to potentially affect a patient. And a common question that that comes up is how much can we remove safely? And the the answer is pretty simple in that typically about half. Um, you can remove about half of the small intestine without concern. The ORAD 50% is better tolerated than the aborad 50% because again, the further you go down the intestines, the more the microbes play a role in basic function and metabolism and B12 and folate and all that shenanigans. Um, so, so removing up to 50% of the intestines, generally you can do very safely. Um, you know, if it's all jejunum, then, you know, typically that's, that's excellent, you know, have minimal concerns. If you're starting to remove some ileum, you're starting to be really concerned about potential problems. There has been cases of up to 85% of the small intestines being re removed with no ill effect. Um, but again, a, a, a discussion to have with the owner, um, you know, if you're getting close to, to that. And generally, you know, short bowel syndrome can be managed um, with appropriate diet, um, low residue diet, small frequent feedings. Most of these animals will have, you know, kind of loose stools and some of these animals will improve over time, some won't. Um, but really, unless I'm at a point where I'm removing 60, 75% of the intestines, um, you know, I'm not really thinking about calling owners intraoperatively, um, assuming everything else is expected. Um, you know, it's just a 
routine resection and anastomosis. It's just a big one. Um, you know, if there's other complicating factors, then maybe I'll, I'll call owners. But uh, if we're removing, you know, 50% or less, typically we can do so very safely, especially if it's uh, the ORAD 50%. When at all possible, save the ileocecal colic junction. Um, you know, that's something that we have to think about when doing subtotal colectomies and stuff in cats. Um, you do have an interception. That's a very common location. Um, so if you're able to spare that, removing it just leads to a higher rate of, you know, large GI signs. So loose stools. We don't really have to worry about the nutritional component too commonly, um, but any, you know, there are reports of having some nutritional issues with, you know, removing the ileocecal colic junction, but by far and away, it's just loose stools that we have to deal with, but still something the owner needs to be aware of as a potential complication. Extremely rare, you know, continence issues. I'm not sure of the pathophysiology there, um, but, you know, it is reported that removing the ileocecal colic junction can create some transient um, I'm not sure, about, I've never read about permanent incontinence, but some transient incontinence um, with that. So, and then of course, always flushing after those procedures, volume dependent on contamination. Again, I do not culture if contamination is my fault, or I believe, you know, I've removed the source of the contaminant. Um, you know, that, that kind of speaks to something like a, uh, um, you know, a pyometra or an abscess or something like that. If I'm able to remove that source of infection in, in its entirety, just contamination by, by suction and dilution or removing a pyometra or what have you, um, you know, I'm not really going to do much in the way of, of culturing um, in those situations. Now, what are we going to do when we have a negative explore? Um, we're going to... Um, we're gonna get some biopsies. Um, we're gonna get biopsies and, uh, you know, there's several techniques, incisional, um, always full thickness, using a blade, a sharp blade, or utilizing a uh, um, punch biopsy is very common as well. So um, so, so that's all things that we're, we're thinking about. And again, this comes down to also um, location, 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 you know, don't, don't take a duodenal biopsy near the major duodenal papilla. Don't do it. Um, you know, take it in the distal duodenum where you have to come back and resect a leaking site. It's easy. Um, you know, jejunum is not important in terms of location. All the jejunum is easy to come back. Uh, stomach, you know, typically any section of the stomach is fine. Ilium um, is important. So using an incision, using a punch, the technique shown there is a um, passing a suture to create a nice full thickness, easier to, to grab that chunk of um, incision there, label the location and put it in formalin. Um, colotomy, colectomy, you know, just try to avoid the stay, try to avoid the, uh, the large intestine if you can. The vasculars, vasculature is so much more delicate and, um, you know, small, small damage there can lead to a, a huge problem. Just for your information, five to eight centimeter recommendation for, for colon tumors. Um, you know, techniques are more or less the same as the small intestines. Post-op, you know, GI surgery, um, you know, always considering how critical your patient is. ECG blood pressure monitoring is warranted, especially in septic peritonitis. I'm a huge fan of serial AFAST. Um, all of my patients get serial AFAST after surgery. Um, that way I can monitor fluid production, accumulation, things like that. Rapid reintroduction of food, you know, about four hours post offering small frequent meals. Um, consider NG tube, E tube if necessary, um, especially if you're working in the duodenum. Those patients typically take longer to rebound. They deal with more ileus and getting some nutrition into them, you know, more rapidly is important. Um, you can't judge a shingle post abdominal effusion level, lactate level, blood glucose level, anything. Um, the only re reliable monitoring technique for you know, leakage at your surgery site is a uh, serial cytology um, of the abdominal fluid. So, you know, if there's enough fluid to, to, to sample, then, you know, sample it and you have to do it serially and expect some intracellular bacteria after even clean surgery, expect some extracellular bacteria after clean surgery. Seeing those trends of it increasing are concerning, seeing in trends of increasing fluid are concerning, but also knowing the pathophysiology. Um, if you're doing a septic peritonitis, and then you can expect that fluid to accumulate for 24 hours and that volume to go up. So you have to utilize, you know, clinical assessment as well. 
I don't routinely use JP drains. Um, you know, studies have shown there's no difference in outcomes with using one and not using one. And again, we don't know how to interpret those samples. You can't use a JP drain and check serial lactate. You can't use a JP drain and check serial VG. Um, we don't we don't know how to interpret those results. There's a beautiful 70 page thesis on this that um, is a pain, but uh, very very important. Again, the only real way, you know, reliable study way to to monitor serially are you know serial cytology of those of that fluid. So, you know, we're we're we're, we're running quite long, um, and I apologize for for that. Um, so, um, I think, Paige, you know, what are your thoughts on? Yeah, I think if, if you're okay, continue to talk, at, you know, if anyone needs to hop off, because that's where they're at in their evening, that's fine. But if you're okay talking, I know the folks that are going to stay on will continue to enjoy what you have to share. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to stay on, but please, everyone, feel free. I um, got so excited about this talk. I put more information in there than I probably plan to um, <laughs> or could get through in a reliable amount of time. So, um, but again, if you attended, you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint and everything um, emailed to you. So, so uh, splenectomy, um, you know, big things with splenectomies are, you know, your preoperative considerations. Is this patient stable? Is it unstable? Do you have a hemoabdomen? Is this elective? You know, were you doing your, you know, annual wellness abdominal films and picked up on a mid-abdominal mass? You know, some of the numbers for, you know, quoting owners, uh, malignancies are are actually becoming more and more uh, positive. You know, all those numbers that we've learned in vet school are all retrospective studies. Um, they've actually done a couple of prospective studies and, you know, the numbers are more more promising. So, you know, if you have a non-emergent, non-hemoabdomen, you know, there's roughly a 50-50 chance. Benign versus malignant, you know, it's technically of 47 to 53, but, you know, keep it simple in your mind, keep it simple to the owner, 50-50. Um, that was a study in 2016. And then if it's a hemoabdomen, you know, we all were kind of taught, you know, the, the two-thirds rule, um, but, you know, actually roughly 60-40, um, you know, benign versus malignant. So 40% uh, are benign, 60% um, are malignant. And that was an actual prospective study done uh, just a couple of years ago. So, you know, maybe there's a little more um, encouraging things to be said for these patients that come in with splenic masses and even hemoabdomens. Um, so, so it's still, you know, a big deal um, and still a, a good chance of malignancy, but, um, you know, the numbers are trending to slightly more positive now that we're actually getting some prospective studies. Short-term mortality, um, you know, before discharge and before suture removal. So essentially within two weeks of surgery, you know, that's an 11% mortality rate with these guys. And that comes down to a number of factors. You know, is it a malignancy? Is there already metastasis? Are they going to have ventricular arrhythmias? Um, that's that's the tough thing. Um, splenectomies are rarely a drop everything and cut surgical emergency. Um, so just because you have a patient come into your hospital with a, with a hemoabdomen, um, doesn't always mean you got to get in the operating room within an hour. Um, and that's the case with many things. So most are chronic bleeds that we're seeing the end result. Um, few are actively hemorrhaging. Um, many may be actively leaking, but hemorrhaging, not so much. And, you know, what I've found out, unfortunately, in some of the places I've studied is there's there's not a lot of surgeons that are going to go in the middle of the night for a, a hemoabdomen. Um, we, we think they should, and it's easy to have that mindset, but, um, you know, most of these in, in an academic setting are being medically managed overnight, blood transfusions if necessary, and, um, you know, being being cut, you know, the following day. You know, optimization is incredibly important for all of these patients, and, um, you know, at point C, if we practice, you know, trying to get these things taken care of in a the most rapid, safe way possible. Um, so there's plenty of these that get cut overnight. There's plenty of these that get stabilized and cut the next day. It is all very, very patient dependent and using your best judgment. Um, for the procedure, I'm lucky I have a vessel sealing device. So just, uh, you know, coag and cut along the hilus and as close to the spleen as possible for the uh, adhesions. The hyalur technique is tricky because you have to be able to visualize all of the um, vessels. And the biggest thing you worry about is killing the pancreas. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I have had a, a kitty cat patient with a 
nasty spleen and even with the vessel sealer we ended up you know damaging the the left limb of the pancreas and had to do a partial pancreatectomy um after so you know keeping a keeping an eye on the pancreas after splenectomy is is very important um there's the ligate everything technique which is sometimes all you can do especially when it's a big mass and lots of adhesions and it's ruptured before and there's just everything everywhere you know just try to ligate everything that needs ligating um Always remove the whole thing. Uh, you know, I never, never leave any of the spleen behind. There, there's no need to, um, you know, just take the whole thing. Um, I am a strong advocate of getting a liver biopsy. Um, I trained where an oncologist was and they wanted a liver biopsy. I've talked to several of my colleagues that are in current, you know, oncology residencies and they want liver biopsies. So, you know, anytime you take a spleen out, even if the liver is normal, there's a 95% chance it's going to be normal. Um, but if there's any chance these people might want to follow up with chemo, the, the oncologist would really like a, a liver biopsy to rule out micrometastasis. Um, I prefer a guillotine technique of the quadrate lobe. So that's going to be the little finger-like projection extending from the gallbladder. Um, so, so. When you're taking the spleen out, in general, two or three OPDS, and um, you know each vessel should be individually ligated, meaning the meaning the artery and vein. Um, ligating them together, you know, could create an AV fistula. Um, more of an academic thing, but still, we try to practice best practices. Um, two ligatures stay with the patient; one goes with the spleen. So, two ligatures staying with the patient for double security, and one goes with the spleen just to prevent backflow. I typically utilize a friction knot, um, such as a strangle or a constrictor knot, followed by a transfixing, especially in the bigger vessels. Um, you know, utilizing basic circumferentials is fine, whatever works well for you, but I do prefer a friction knot to start because they, they maintain that friction better. Uh, many people um, also utilize a uh, modified Miller's, which is a great option as well. Um, even if I'm using a vessel sealer, I'll often individually ligate the splenic artery and vein for added security. Um, you know, the vessel sealer is great, but it's not infallible. Um, so, so again, all those little extra steps to make us sleep better at night. Post-op splenectomy, minimum 24 hours of continuous ETG monitoring. Um, you know, there are reports of even up to 36 hours plus of having um, delayed arrhythmias, but minimum 24 hours in the hospital with continuous ECG. Uh, things we're worried about mainly are ventricular premature contractions. So um, the spleen actually plays a, a big role in the autonomic nervous system. Um, so when we remove the spleen, we remove one of those checks and balances of the autonomic nervous system, and it can create an increase in you know, sympathetic tone that can lead to those ventricular arrhythmias. Um, we treat them when they are tachycardic, so greater than 160 to 180. If there's R on T phenomenon, if we have pulse deficits, if we have hypotension, Typically, a 2% lidocaine bolus of 2 to 4 mg per kg IV over about a minute. Um, you can repeat up to 8 mg per kg over 10 minutes. Um, if they haven't converted fully, then you can consider starting a CRI, 50 to 80 mics per kg per minute. Um, if the lidocaine is not being effective and you have procanamide, that's the next step. And then for patients that have continued um, problems, you know, uh, medical management with an oral to go home like sodalol or amiodarone, um, can be used for maintenance for several weeks until we show that their um, arrhythmias have resolved. Again, serial AFAST for me postoperatively, making sure there's no uh, residual bleeding, um, make sure there's no fluid accumulation um, is, is very important. Now to the other most common procedure you guys that do, cystotomies. Um, you know, be sure to alleviate life-threatening obstructions at present. Um, main thing we would deal with are electrolyte abnormality, so making sure we have, you know, that information before. Um, this is the one exception to the smaller abdominal incisions for me and healthy, um, but still if it's an older patient, an unhealthy patient, um, I'll make a much larger inc incision, um, but still my incision has to be big enough for me to get my hand all the way up there so I can palpate the spleen, you know, rub on the kidneys, make sure there's nothing grossly abnormal in the abdomen. Um, again, paraprepucial in males uh, and careful of the caudal superficial epigastric um, as it's coming through. Um, Preoperative films are imperative. Most of the time we're doing a cystotomy because of stone, so making sure 
the stones are present and then post operatively to make sure that you got them all and if you didn't get them all go back and get them um you know that's the that's the tough part you know if they're there for 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 that and then we need to try to do our best to to get all the stones because even if we try this solution and things like that ultimately that stone may become the size that's perfect for obstruction um and we don't want to you know have that on our clients or us if we can help it so for the procedure, you know, packing the bladder with moist lap sponges. Um, I typically use a cruciform 3O PDS in the apex of the bladder. There's that nice, beautiful scar in the apex of the bladder that I put my stay suture. Um, a single pass is fine, um, but a cruciform spreads that tension a little bit better, especially if you're going to be applying traction for a period of time, um, decreases the damage to the bladder itself. Stab incision ventrally. Um, ventrally, ventrally, ventrally. So a ventral incision is far superior to a, a dorsal approach, um, mainly in terms of visualization. Uh, dorsal approaches pretty much make it impossible to thoroughly evaluate the trigone because you have to retroflex the bladder to get to the dorsal surface. Um, so a ventral incision uh, near the you know, apex and body of the bladder. Again, I'm using a 15 blade for my stab incision, immediate suction, and then extending with medicine bombs um, large enough to remove the largest stone without damaging the bladder or big enough for me to get my finger in um, to make sure that I'm able to palpate thoroughly the abdomen um, the bladder to make sure I can uh, get it, get all the stones out. Bladder spoon is imperative um, and a lot, a lot of flushing, you know, flushing, normal grade, retrograde. Uh, the last thing you want to do is leave a stone behind and have to go back in and get it. Um, so in females, uh, retrograde flushing is a little bit more difficult, but if you're able to pass a, pass a red rubber normal grade, so through the bladder out the um, vulva, you can then suture through the Murphy hole in each um, so that there's now a red rubber end to end and you can pull it back in um, to pull that in retrograde. Um, it's, a, it's a healthy little, little tick there. Um, again, making sure that if you're doing that, that you have flushed and douched the uh the vulva adequately to help you know decrease that microbial contamination always obtain a aerobic culture and susceptibility of the bladder mucosa um anytime there's stones you know, we want to make sure we get a bladder bladder wall um aerobic culture with susceptibility just you know through your cystotomy site and grab a little piece of that mucosa mets and bombs and put it in your culture at you know it's, it's that simple um Closing the bladder, if it's a thickened bladder, like many are, they're thick, edematous, and cranky, I'll just use 4 OPDS and interrupted. Again, patient size doesn't matter. Great Dane, Yorkie, 4 OPDS, simple interrupted. Um, full thickness. So what they've shown is that we used to think that it, it was a bad thing to go full thickness in the bladder, but they've had some studies uh, that show that the bladder actually heals so rapidly that those full thickness sutures get covered with mucosa rapidly and don't actually become a sore sternitis of infection. Um, so, so again, be robust with your, with your suture bites, um, full thickness is very appropriate, um, because again, of the healing capacity of the bladder, we don't actually create a nidus of stone formation in the future, they've determined. If it's a somewhat normal bladder, a 4 OPDS and a continuous, followed by a Cushing, um, if it's a nice plat, pliable bladder, um, two-layer closure, but most of them are thickened and inflamed, and I'll do a simple interrupted, um, with 4 OPDS. Any questions about cystotomy since that was another another top one? No, no questions. Great. C-sections. C-sections are not a race. Um, you know, it is a procedure that needs to be done efficiently, but it's not a race. Um, average survivability of puppies is 80 to 90 percent. Again, something just to talk to the owner about. There's no difference in survival of puppies with propofol versus alone. And when using propofol, it's actually recommended to not remove the puppies from the uterus for 15 to 20 minutes because the mother has to fully metabolize that propofol. If you get those puppies out before, they're actually still dealing with their propofol and they don't really have the ability to metabolize it well. So often, you know, when you come time for induction, you know, you're going to be almost waiting on that 15 minute mark to, to get those puppies out. Minimal pre-meds avoid ketamine. Um, glyco does not cross the placenta. So if you have low fetal heart rates, atropine, uh, 0.01 to 0.02 mg per kg to the mother, not to the, each puppy. Um, 
Once the puppies are out, a single dose of a pure mu, um, generally 0.1 mg per kilo hydro, nothing wrong with, you know, buprenorphine or uh, methadone or something like that. But again, I'm not a big fan of buprenorphine in dogs. So no seed is invaluable for these guys. If you have that, that ability, um, consider an epidural. Um, you know, epidurals, again, I'm not sold on their ability to help with general abdominal procedures. Um, but, you know, consider an epidural for these guys. Um, you know, there are some folks that allegedly do them awake with epidurals and local blocks. Um, there's no evidence for the use of dextrose in the dam's IV fluids, um, but some people like it. And anecdotally, they think it helps increase vigor, you know, two and a half to 5% dextrose solution. Um, some people like that. Uh, again, no evidence that it's helpful, but maybe beneficial. Most of these creatures are brachycephalic, so you gotta treat them like any other brachycephalic, you know, serenia, pre-oxygenate, <laughs> uh, motility drugs, extreme caution post, <laughs> um, you know, these, these brachycephalics can be, you know, recovery nightmares. So using extreme caution with, with them. For the procedure, again, remember it's not a race. Efficiency is key, not speed. Um, do as much before induction as possible. You know, if you're able to clip them while they're being pre-oxygenated, um, if you're able to do your dirty prep while they're pre being oxygenated, um, you know, those are invaluable things. Typically, um, by the time we are, you know, ready and induced and everything, I'm I'm ready to make my incision. So uh, once they're induced and on the table, you know, I'm making my abdominal incision and I'm I'm waiting on the clock to reach that 15 to 20 minute mark from induction to actually start removing puppies. So um, you know, I've got the the uterus out. I'm ready to make my incision and take the first puppy out. Um, again, typically between 15 and 20 minutes of induction, so that the propofol has had time to be metabolized by the mother. Large ventral midline incision. These uteruses are big. You know, no need to to fight your abdominal incision. Um, you know, big incision make it easy to get out. Um, you know, pack off the abdomen. You know, the the contents within the uterus, even though it looks nasty, it should be sterile. Um, so even if there is some contamination, it should be sterile contamination. Um, but still trying to avoid as much contamination as possible. I like to make it single incision ventrally on the uterine body, again, ventrally on the on the uterine body. Um, some make a single incision over each puppy. You know, that's something I've heard some uh, Therio folks talk about. Some people will make one incision in each uterine horn, um, especially if there's maybe two surgeons tag teaming, for example. Um, but again, generally a stab incision over the body of the uterus extended uh, with medicine bombs. Very careful to avoid puppies if there's any stuck in the pelvic canal or, you know, making their way down that way, you know, milking them back where they're out of the out of the way, but you know, very careful with the puppies. Sometimes you got to take the puppy out of the canal first if they can't come out that way. Um, but you know, getting the first puppy out, I remove the puppy, I rupture the allantoic sac, and I ligate the umbilicus with about a centimeter of uh, umbilicus remaining with 3O PDS before passing the puppy off. This allows me to have direct venous access through the umbilical vein should this puppy need emergency resuscitation of drugs. Um, so that's, uh, you know, something that I typically do. Um, and then that's also less time between separation from the mother and, you know, being exposed to the outside world. So I don't want to take their, you know, placenta away and then pass them off. And then the assistant has to rupture everything and get them separated. And, you know, that, that few seconds of extra time with mom, I think is important. Um, then a firm grip on the island toe exact, firm, gentle traction to remove the placenta. Um, the tricky part is knowing how hard to pull, but remember they have a zonary placenta, so it's all the way around. Um, so it can be difficult and it can be tough to break down. So firm, steady, increasing traction is important. If the placenta cannot be extracted comfortably, you can leave it in and let it pass on its own. Um, that's very acceptable. Um, I've never had to leave one behind. Um, some of you may have, and that's okay. It's very fine to, to leave the placenta and let, let mother do her job. Then follow the same procedure with each puppy. Pull a puppy out, rupture the sack, tie it off, hand it off, rupture the sack, pull it off, tie it off, hand it off. Um, again, efficiency is key, not recklessness. As long as the puppies are attached to mom, they're at least partially protected. Yes, they're getting exposed to anesthetic gases the longer time goes on, but again, you know, efficiency here. You're not, you're not lollygagging, joking around, but you're not carelessly slicing and dicing either. 
Um, once all the puppies and the placentas are removed, inspect the abdomen for damage. So sometimes those uterine vessels, when you're you know, stretching things or pulling on things, can get damaged. So those can be significant bleeding. They can be life-threatening hemorrhage. So a thorough explore after you've completed your, your C-section, the puppies are removed. Um, and once you're able to get get the explore done and start your suturing, you know the, the uterus should be normal starting to involute. If it's not, you can give one to five units of oxytocin um, to help with that process. Closing the uterus can be done in a single simple continuous, typically two to three OPDS, again, size matched. Most of the time, three, three OPDS is very appropriate. Um, utilizing a partial thickness cushing uh, incision or closure after you know your simple continuous, that's fine as well. Um, again, using your judgment based off of you know integrity of the uterus and those kinds of things. But uh, again, there's not a right or wrong here. A single continuous is again just as effective as a continuous and over someone with with cushing. And I, I've never gotten into the Utrecht thing. Um, I know some people like it, but I've I've never really gotten into it. And yes, lavage after this procedure, like every other abdominal procedure, you know, a nice Lavage is going to be nothing but help. Next question is, you know, how many of you guys are, um, how are you guys closing your linea? And we're we're getting we're getting close to the end here. Again, thanks for staying with me. And um, you know, sorry for going a little bit long. All right, great. So, you know, three quarters are closing with a continuous. Um, you know, about a quarter are going with interrupted, and a few of you are going with cruciates. Um, so, so that's. That's all very appropriate. I'm a continuous person myself. Um, so now that we've completed our procedure, it's time to flush and close the abdomen. Um, a couple of notes here, should I culture? It's extremely uncommon for me to culture after any of these procedures. Um, again, the exception is bladder wall culture of the cystotomy. Um, all cultures should be performed in the most sterile way. So meaning at the very end, you've flushed all the contaminants away. It's as clean as it's gonna get. If you feel it's necessary to culture, that's when you culture. Don't culture the contaminated part. Don't culture what came out of the intestines. Um, you know, only culture essentially the cleanest abdomen as possible. And this is the same for all cultures. You know, all cultures should undergo a the thorough sterile prep before performing them. You know, a patient comes in with an abscess, you know, don't shove your culture in the abscess and expect to get a good culture result back. You know, that abscess should be cleaned and flushed and lanced and fully treated. And then at the end, grab yourself a nice deep tissue sample. Tissue is best for pretty much all cultures. That's why we don't just swab the inside of the, the cystotomy site. We grab a piece of that mucosa. Um, so again, grabbing tissue for culture is typically better than swabbing. And again, a sterile, sterile prep should be performed. The one exception for me is typically if I go in on a septic peritonitis, you know, it's it's either had surgery before that's now leaking or maybe it has a GI mass that's ruptured or something like that. You know, those cases I will, you know, culture at the very end. Um, typically, you know, again, I will culture the abdomen after it's right before I'm about to close. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll culture some of the deep tissue of the abscess that's present as well, um, if there is one, for example. Um, generally, if you're not messing with the liver and gallbladder aerobic with susceptibility, um, Intraperitoneal antibiotics. I've I've never heard anyone recommend this. Um, I know it's I, I've I've heard of people doing it. Um, in humans, it's been shown to not really be effective for fecal contamination, small intestinal contamination, or prevention of pancreatic fistula. Um, there was a study in dogs that showed no difference in culture results with and without without intraperitoneal antibiotics. Um, so I'm not. A, a fan of that, I'm not really an advocate for it. Um, abdominal closure, again, this is where it comes back to getting a look good abdominal linea component. So about three to five millimeters by three to five millimeters. The goal of apposition, not inversion or eversion. Um, again, I'm always using PDS on a taper here. There's some sizing recommendations, you know, this is where I do typically go big um, for these guys because that, that linea is extremely robust and extremely tough. So 40 kick dogs or more, I'm going with a one PDS, roughly 20 to 40, zero alt, 10 to 20, 20, less than TIG, 10, three. These are rough ranges, kind of depending on body condition, those types of things. Um, so again, 
whatever you know helps you feel best and you know this is kind of one of those sometimes when i will typically size pretty big um especially in my giant dogs one pds is quite a robust suture um once i closed the linea um there was a study that i read i couldn't find it to so source it for you um again but there was a study that showed that flushing the uh sub-Q closure after linea closure is shown to decrease incisional site infection. So um, I've adopted that habit recently. So after I close the linea, flushing that sub-Q with a little bit of the flush I have left over. The subcutaneous tissue enclosure should create apposition of the epidermis. Um, and I quilt every second to third bite. Um, sometimes I quilt every bite just out of habit. Um, and this has been shown to reduce the aroma formation quilting of um, the, these incisions. And what I mean is that when you close your sub-Q, um, your incision should be beautiful and well opposed. Uh, your skin suture should not be holding things under tension. Um, so, you know, if you're pulling skin edges together with your with your uh, skin layer, you could probably do a better job in your subcutaneous of creating good apposition. Your subcutaneous is a very nice holding layer. Your skin layer is not. The epidermis is not. So, um, you know, having a nice closure with your sub-Q that's almost could pass as being done is typically my goal. And then purely apposition for my skin. I use a lot of intradermal for all the surgeries I do these days. And truth be told, the main reason I do that is that they don't have to come back for uh, suture removal. Um, one less time, these patients have to come in the house, hospital, 10 minutes less nurses are having to take sutures out. Um, you know, it takes me an extra two or three minutes to do an intradermal versus a continuous versus interrupted cruciates. So um, for me, almost every procedure I'm doing, I'm doing an intradermal, you know, TPLOs, abdominal procedures, Cialis heels, what have you. Um, so to keep that in mind, and typically I'm using a 4 monocryl. So again, not a very strong suture because again, all my tension is being held by my sub-Q layer. So just this tiny little 4 monocryl on a reverse cutting. Again, the only time I use a reverse cutting. And then uh, that allows me to have owners email photos and incisions at, at healing versus you know, having to come in and either have suture removed or you know take up times, create a chart, make notes, this, that, and the other. So that's the end, finally. Uh, this was a fun thing I did last week, a complete caudactomy on an um, English bulldog. And I, I found it incredibly disgusting when I've never actually unfolded one of these before. And uh, my nurse was like, can you unfold that? And I said, sure. So that bottom right picture is, bottom left picture is, you know, how it was in the patient. And then we unfolded it and that's what it looked like on the inside, which is pretty gross. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, you know, if you have any further questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks for hanging out with me a little long. And um, yeah, thanks again. I have a couple, a few questions here. Are you available? Yes. Okay. I think you answered this, but I'll be formal and, and ask it. How do you like to do your liver biopsies? Yes, so um, for my liver biopsies, I use a, a guillotine technique where I will take a, a two-aught or a three-aught PDS. Um, I will create a preformed loop. It's typically just a surgeon's throw, you know, a very loose surgeon's throw. Um, I will then use an Alice tissue forcep to grab typically the quadrate lobe because it's typically the most extended caudal. Um, it's just to the right of the gallbladder, and it's normally freely mobile. Um, Alice tissue to gently grab and retract, slide the suture over, and then just tie a knot. Um, it crushes the tissue um, and, you know, gives me a nice sample. Size is, you know, it doesn't have to be large. You know, a very small size is all that's needed. Of course, if there's an abnormal section of the liver, you want to get the abnormal. And that goes for any biopsy. Um, you know, you want to, if there's something abnormal, biopsy it. You know, you don't want to biopsy a normal part of intestine when there's an abnormal part next to it. Um, and the same thing with the liver. You don't want to, the entire thing is grossly normal, excellent, but if there's an obvious disease pathology present, you're going to want to try to biopsy that. Um, utilizing a punch is excellent. Um, you know, if you, if you don't, if you have a lesion near a periphery of a big lobe and you can't do a guillotine routinely, um, a, you know, four millimeter punch biopsy is my next go-to. Um, just a little biopsy. Um, and then using your medicine bombs to remove it and then, you know, packing it with a little gel foam or if you don't have gel foam, packing it with a little momentum or something will typically resolve that bleeding rapidly. Great. Thank you. Um, back to C-sections. My colleague does a uterine flush before closing. Is there any benefit? I've never read 
Um, I, I've never read um, any any benefit to that. Um, so to my knowledge, no. Okay. Um, for a first year vet out in practice, what are your recommendations if you cut into the muscle and have a hard time finding the linea when it comes to closing? To clean off all the soft tissues around the muscle. Um, even if you end up making a paramedian incision, um, utilizing, again, a sharp pair of medicine bombs and a nice, it's called a push cut technique, um, which is readily, you know, um, Googleable. Um, you know, if you make that paramedian incision, um, just cleaning off all the soft tissue around where your incision ends up being. Um, whether it's dead center on midline or not is not important for closure strength. As long as you're able to identify the external rectus sheath, that's the holding layer. So, um, you know, there, a, an incision on midline is not stronger than a incision a centimeter off of midline. Um, it's just a little bit more morbidity for the patient, a little bit more muscle soreness. Um, most of the time we stray a little bit caudally anyway, because the further caudal you go, the more the uh, muscles are fusing, um, the less robust the actual linea is, especially in cats. So um, yeah, just even if you are paramedian, cleaning off all those soft tissues around your incision so you can visualize that linea or that external rectus sheath. Great, thank you. Um, another question back to back to pios and antibiotics. Do you send your pios home with antibiotics post op? I do not. There's a we've, we've had a fun debate in the hospital um, about that, and again. Anytime I believe I can remove the source of infection, um, I typically do not reach for antibiotics um, unless there's some other reason to. So, you know, a non-ruptured, closed, or even an open PIO, um, I do not routinely send home on antibiotics. Again, they get their 24 hours of perioperative antibiotics, um, but I typically do not send them home with uh, antibiotics. Okay, I'll have a follow-up question to that. That's my own question. Um, does what their pre-op white blood cell count change that at all to you? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, if you have a if you have a patient that seems to be septicemic, then absolutely, um, you know, aggressive antibiotic therapy at that point. Um, but if you just have the young dog with a little discharge, like the eleven month old German Shepherd that I forget Abigail did last week. Um, no, I'm not sending those guys home on antibiotics, but yes, absolutely important to look at the entire picture. And if there's any question of septicemia, systemic disease, then perhaps thinking for sure, probably antibiotics are appropriate. Okay. Another question, any hints for cats with the very wide thin lineas, the ones that feel like a hernia? <laughs> um, not really, no, they're, uh, there, as I mentioned, typically the linea more cranially is wider and thinner, and then it becomes tapered, and then it almost goes away as you move caudally. Um, you know, the, the same thing applies of just creating a good visualization of that of that linea, so you can be sure to engage it with your with your sutures. Um, one thing I didn't talk about much is the idea of a full thickness versus just biting the external rectus sheath. Um, in, in animals, there's no obvious difference in terms of you know, morbidity with making a good full thickness bite versus just engaging the external rectus sheath. But in women after cesarean, um, they have reported that engaging the peritoneum increases post-operative discomfort. So, so in cats and dogs and anyone, really most of the time I am trying just to engage the external rectus sheath. Um, I'm not going to rebite something if I make a full thickness bite by any means or if I incorporate the peritoneum. Um, but, but typically, as long as you're able to visualize and get a nice, in a cat, you know, two to three millimeter depth of, um, of the external rectus sheath should be very healthy and always quilting for your sub-Q layer to reduce the aroma formation. Right. And then I have a thank you, great talk. I don't Thank have you. any additional questions. Great. I'll give everybody just a second, just in case we still have a good amount of folks still on.
All right, great. So I think, you know, coming up next is uh, Dr. Young, um, a, a pharmacist who's going to be picking a topic to chat with us about next month as we continue our, our monthly series of uh, Vets Pets presentations. So um, all looking forward to that. Thank you, Dr. Brady. Thank you for everyone that's hung on. And we really appreciate your information as we all struggle through some of these surgeries, making it up as we go along. So this, this helps a whole lot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're, all, <laughs> we're always making stuff up. No. <laughs> Me too. So thank y'all very much for your time and y'all have a great night. Thank you.